Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with part two of our survey of all of the major Bach choral works. This time, we're going to cover them on period instruments. Now, if you tuned in to our last episode of Bach choral works, you will remember that there are five that we're talking about. The Magnificat, the Christmas Oratorio, the Two Passions, that is St. John and St. Matthew, and the B Minor Mass. And last time, our choices were Berenboim for the Magnificat, uh, Jochum for the Christmas Oratorio, Schreier for the St. John Passion, Klemperer for the St. Matthew Passion, and Richter for the B Minor Mass. I think I got those right, I hope so. And now we're going to talk about period instruments. And as I mentioned a little bit back then, you know, in some ways the situation is very different. In some ways the situation is quite similar. How is it different? What's different is that back in the day when normal instruments and normal ensembles played Bach's major choral works, it was something of a special occasion because everybody knew that modern instruments and ensembles were not ideally suited to the forces that Bach had. So the first thing you needed to do, there was always a tendency towards what you might call authenticity because we tried, these performers tried to have as much of the performance as modern players could do. In other words, they started using harpsichord continuos. They started using smaller forces. They started trying to, you know, liven up the tempos a little bit. Some, like Klemperer, were almost entirely anachronistic because he was a conductorial genius who had his own view of what Bach ought to sound like. And there are always personal interpretations, of course, of this music which makes them, I suppose, romantic, but I don't think it's any different from it's been in any point in human history. The real difference between previous performances and period instrument performances now is that they're nothing special now because there are a million period instrument groups out there that specialize in this exact repertoire. The, the result then has been an enormous, an enormous outpouring of recordings, huge numbers of recordings of pieces that used to be really, really specialist repertoire. I mean, there were a few conductors who did major Bach pieces back then. There were a couple specialist ensembles like Richter's or Munchinger's, you know, but basically, basically they were rather few and far between, except for the kind of of local music making that went on in, in, in churches and church choirs with their pickup orchestral forces. Now we have a, a bazillion period instrument groups and, and most of them are very, very good. A lot of them are really, really good. And the interesting thing about this whole, this whole scenario is that there are aspects of the period instrument performance movement which are hopelessly inauthentic. One of those is the idea that, that we played the music too slowly back then. The, the truth of the matter is that today's period instrument ensembles, especially in quick tempos, play the music far, far faster than anybody could possibly have done back at the time with their ill-rehearsed, somewhat slipshod, um, pick up ensembles and and lack of lack of preparation and and the serious just inability technically of the instruments to play things at the speeds that we play them today. All of this fast light stuff, it's all nonsense. It never happened. It didn't happen back then and until recently it didn't happen now. Now it does. That's a modern thing. The other modern thing, of course, and it's major, is the participation of women. Women! We like women. Women are wonderful. Women have beautiful voices. It's so much better than having church choirs composed of nothing but men and boys and hooty male altos. We have hooty male altos. We have counter tenors. And, and you know, but, but again, they're very, very well-trained, superbly trained singers. And they often sing very, very beautifully. And for soprano roles, we don't use castratos. We don't use, you know, high male altos. We use women, really terrific women who sing gorgeously. And, and that's one aspect of inauthenticity, if you want to call it that, or lack of authenticity. And one way also in which, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. When it comes to choral music, 
particularly Bach's choral music. I mean, it really, it doesn't really matter whether you use period instruments or modern instruments because all they're doing is accompanying. And the human voice is the human voice is the human voice. It has been the same since the dawn of the human voice. You know, so, so in terms of the overall timbral quality of, of the music, to the extent that it's dominated by voices, <laughs> it hasn't changed at all. It really hasn't. And our preference for these, these pure white, relatively low vibrato style voices, you know, the old Emma Kirkby school of singing, that's also nonsense. It never happened, never existed, <laughs> it shouldn't exist. People don't sound that way, except of course, for the individual singers who have that kind of white, clear voice. And, and they exist, they've always existed, but most singers don't have it. And that's another reason why the, the instrumental component, the, the absence of vibrato and whatnot is such hopeless nonsense because everybody has always known since the dawn of time that all human voices have a natural level of vibrato. And there's a distinction made in vocal treatises, both then and now, between, between natural vibrato, which all voices have, and artificial vibrato, which you add for expressive effect. And instruments, to the extent that they imitate the human voice, should all have a natural vibrato, and they should all have more available for expressive effect. So in all of those ways, the period instrument movement is completely a modern phenomenon that has no basis in anything historical. Let's be clear about that. I mean, this is, these are simple, simple truths. They really are. It's not a question of interpretation. It's, it's all just foolishness that's being, that's being thrown at us in the name of authenticity to give people employment. The same thing with using teeny, 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 tiny forces, which we'll talk about more later. I mean, the idea of using smaller forces is simply economics. There's nothing else to be said for it. It's economics or the idea of enforcing a vision of authenticity that was the product of economics. For example, you could say as, for example, you know, uh, conductors like Joshua Rifkin had that Bach's music should be played one person to a part because he only had those, those forces available. Well, that's a historical reconstruction. That's not an aesthetic position, I, I feel. I really don't. And because the fact of the matter is that no conductor worth their salt would write a piece for three trumpets and timpani in single strings. <laughs> That's in completely insane. It's totally out of whack. It's out of balance. You wouldn't want one singer to a part. You want as many people as you can comfortably have that suit the expressive range of the music. Right? And, and that's true of, of any period. These are just practical considerations that, that any artist worth his, his artistic sensibility would take into account. So I'm not dealing with these, these historical reconstruction things because they're wholly speculative. And I think most of the time, extremely unsatisfying that you can do this music fabulously with smaller forces, that it gains something in terms of contrapuntal clarity by having, by having a, a, an ensemble in which everything is in balance in terms of the size of the participants. Well, I don't, I don't dispute that, and we'll hear some of those. So let's get right to it, shall we? We began with the Magnificat, and we're going to begin again with the Magnificat. Now, I have chosen a selection of, I think, uh, period instrument performances, period instrument style performances, that really, really sort of reveal the range of what's on offer and some of the best participants available today, whose music making you can invariably trust, really. They, everything they do in this repertoire usually is very, very good. We're very lucky right now. We have, we have the singers, we have wonderful singers trained in the style of Baroque singing, and we have spectacular instrumental forces, whether they play on modern or period instruments, all of whom have, have a, in a heightened sense of what idiomatic performance ought to be. And that sense doesn't really depend on any sort of historicity of approach. It has to do with musicality. It has to do with our own interpretive preferences today for how we like to hear the music. And I would add, the way we usually like to hear the music is not in a liturgical context. It's in a concert situation. And a concert situation is rather different. It's bound to be rather different. So for the Bach Magnificat, I chose 
The 16 with Harry Christopher's on Coro. This is a wonderful disc. It comes with the Vivaldi Gloria, which everybody loves. I, I sang it in college glee club. We sang the Bach Magnificat too, which is like a billion times harder. We sang the Bach Magnificat in high school. My God, that's hard. Oh my God, you know the opening. Magnificat. It's a bear. This is a wonderful performance. It's lively, but it's not hysterical. You know, like the way John Elliott Gardner does it. I mean, it's so blazing fast and it's exciting and it's amazing that they can do it at that tempo. But is it expressive of the words? I mean, does that sound like the Virgin Mary expressing her, her gratitude to God for having been told that she's about to give, you know, she's going to give birth to the, the savior of mankind? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy, but I wouldn't exactly be hopping up and down on a musical pogo stick. I mean, there's a little bit of a difference there, you know? So this is a, a graceful, deliciously fresh, lively performance, immaculately sung by everybody involved. You know, the 16 is an amazing group. Christopher's is a fabulous conductor of this music. I, I mean, and, and Cora, which is their own label, deserves everybody's support. They are a, a, a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous group. Their handle is fabulous, too. We'll be talking about that. And I have permission to use sound clips from them. So we'll be, we'll be playing some samples. It's just great stuff. So that's, that is the Magnificat. Next, the Christmas Oratorio. Now, the Christmas Oratorio, as I mentioned before, is a series of six cantatas that were never designed to be performed together. You can do them separately on the separate days of Christmas. Nowadays, of course, we just glom them all together and sit you down in a, a concert hall and they play the whole bloody thing. I think it's kind of long if you want to do the whole bloody thing, but there are many, many fine performances. And the, really, one of the ones that turned me on to the whole period instrument thing was the old, the old Harnet Court on Telefunken, which it was just so exciting. You know, it just, it was, it was, it was something, there was something just very new about it and the way it sounded. And I also, because it was Harnet Court, not because it was period anything, you know, it was a real pedal to the metal performance. And it was, you know, at least the first cantata. And it was, it was tremendously exotic, you know, Jauchset, Freud, Lochet, or whatever it's called. It was really, really special. I, I, I really enjoyed it. However, since then, there have been many, many fine performances of the Christmas Oratorio on period instruments, including a second one from Harnoncourt. But the one I picked, because I just think it has the best singing. Remember, this is always about singing. I keep, I can't stress this enough. It's not about the type of instruments you're using or how you play them. It's about how great the singing is. It's not about conducting, particularly. It's about singing. It's vocal music. It's about expressive singing. Always remember that. Always. And for that, I chose René Jacob on Harmonia Mundi because you have you have the singers are Dorothea Rushman. Rush, Dorothea Roshman, okay, whatever. Dorothea Roshman, who's just an amazingly fabulous singer, especially in this repertoire. Andrea Scholl, one of the great male altos out there. And Werner Gura and Klaus Hager and the RAIS Kammerchor, which is just, just the most amazing chamber choir in, in modern and early repertoire. Fabulous, fabulous singing, razor sharp clarity. And Rene Jacob, who is a very, very good conductor of Baroque music. You may recall he was a countertenor. He was not such a good singer, but he's a wonderful conductor in this music. And you've got the Academy for Alta Music Berlin. It's just a knockout in, in terms of Christmas oratorios. You will not hear it better sung on, on, on early instruments, on modern instruments, on electronic instruments, on underwater instruments, on surgical instruments. It just doesn't get better. So. That's the Christmas Oratorio. Okay, now we come to the Passions. As I mentioned before, also, I kind of have a problem with the Passions because I don't care about the story. It doesn't interest me in the least. I have no interest in the spiritual aspect of the music or its religious significance. And I find the Passions to be a slog, no matter who does them. I really do. And again, if you have incredible singing and a real conception of the work, it can work. You know, one of the things that 
the period instrument people due to the passions is they've sped them up a lot, especially compared to Klemper, who was like uniquely slow, three hours and 40 minutes for the St. Matt, right? Whoa, I love it. But uh, a lot of you commented the fact that you find it unlistenable. And I understand. I really do. Even even in the day, Bach performance was about 40 minutes faster than Klemperer did it, right? But but here's the point. The passions are not dramatic. There's a, there's a an attempt to try and make them dramatic by the period instrument folk. And I think that's something of a mistake. I mean, it's it, it doesn't really work. In a way, it becomes even more annoying because the truth of the matter is you've got opening choruses, then you've got the, the story. But the story isn't carried on by, by characters. I mean, yes, the characters exist. They sing lines. But there's a narration with the evangelist, and it's interrupted by chorales all over the place that have no particular reason for being where they are other than to stop the story and have a chorale to make a liturgical point. And then, of course, you've got all the arias salted in. I, you know, I, I, I find them very difficult to listen to. I really do, because I, I just, uh, the music for me goes nowhere. And, and I, I don't care what it's, what it's about, but I, the music as such, I mean, the arias are gorgeous. The choruses are amazing. It's just when you put it all together, it's very, very hard for me to take them in a single dose. I kind of like to spread them out. But in any case, some of these period instrument movements have done extremely well trying to inject more life and movement into these pieces. And I guess it's not a bad thing. I don't know whether it works or whether it just becomes more irritating because it's just not what the music is. You can you can have your own opinion about it. I don't know. You can see I'm just very, very conflicted about these pieces. Magnificent, though I admit they are. And even though I have, you know, 150 recordings of each of them and have heard them a million times, I don't think I'm ever going to like them. And uh, that's just me. And if you don't like them either, good for you. It's okay. But let's talk first about the St. John Passion. Now, the St. John Passion is, is a little bit problematic because it, Bach made lots of changes to it between its original version, what, 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 was the, what was the date here? In like 1749 was the last time he did it, I think. And yes, and then there was originally a 1724 version that had like lots more stuff in it or 1725. I'm gonna pick an unusual selection but one which I think is very successful is successful in, for me, resolving the problems of, of pacing, of, of expression, and, and, you know, all of these issues that, that drive me crazy when listening to these pieces. And I've enjoyed this performance very much. I really have. I have to follow it with a text. And it's ironic, because even though I think the poetry is horrible and I don't care about what they're singing, you have to follow it with a text because it makes so much more sense when you hear what they're doing. You know, there are other pieces, like we did the Wagner thing. I was talking about Meistersinger. I think it's great background music. You know, you can just play it and ignore what they're singing about. With the St. Matthew Passion, you sort of could do that too. With the St. John, no, you can't. It's not that long, first of all, thank God. It's like more like an hour and a half. And, and second of all, I find it so much more effective when you're actually following along. I, 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 I can't explain it. It just makes more sense to me. It gives me something to do while the music's happening. You know, you read about it. Anyway, here it is. Ralph Otto with the, the Bach Corps Mainz and the Bach Orchestra of Mainz on Naxos. Very, very inexpensive. A very smart, smart performance because you get the complete 1749 version. And then as an appendix, you get the, the items that Bach took out from the 1725 version. So you can listen, and you can listen to them separately because they're lovely. There's no reason, again, you don't even have to play this stuff in order. You can dip into it anywhere, I find. But this is an extremely linear, goal-directed, exciting performance of the work. It really is. I, it, 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 it kind of surprised me at just, just how much forward impetus um, the conductor, Rolf Otto, was, was able to bring to it, especially in his wonderful performance of the chorales, which, which have shapeliness and, and movement, and, and it's wonderful. The opening chorus, which I'm going to play you a little bit of, actually, um, is really spooky. He does a really good job because he's got, he's got 
the force is beautifully balanced, beautifully balanced. Listen to the string figuration with the, the woodwinds on top and, and the dissonance that he allows to come out and the clashing harmony. It's really scary. Listen to this for a minute. Everybody sort of assumes that the opening chorus of the St. Matthew Passion is the most amazing thing that Bach ever wrote. It kind of is. It's, it's incredible. But, but boy, this runs at a good second, doesn't it? It's, it's just a wonderful performance. The soloists are fresh-toned. The, the tenor evangelist, I, who is the evangelist here? Let me just, let me just get his name here. Uh, the evangelist, yes, is Georg Poplutz. Georg Poplutz, he's very, he's very effective in, in shaping the text and, and getting you to understand that he's really talking about something that matters. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful performance. And like I said, it's inexpensive. And I, I just, I enjoyed it tremendously. And this is a series. They've done the St. Matthew and they're also doing the Christmas, or they did the Christmas Oratorio, which Ralph Otto has actually recorded twice. He also made an excellent disc on the Karus label of, um, of Bach's son, you know, the old one. What, what was his name? Wilhelm Friedman Bach? What, what, was, what was the oldest one? W.F. Um, of his cantatas. And he's an, he's an expert in this repertoire and he's got the, the Bach Choir of Mainz extremely well trained. And the orchestra, which is essentially a pickup orchestra, um, is, you know, nowadays you can get really good pickup orchestras on period instruments. It's first class, absolutely first class. And a steal at the Naxos price. I saw it on Amazon, it was like 15 bucks. I mean, what's not to love? So it's a wonderful St. John Passion. And the other thing I like about it is even though it's on period instruments and you know everyone wants to make a big deal about that, this is a performance which is in the grand German tradition of sort of community local Bach organizations in the major churches, right? Because we had we had, you know, Richter and then Munchinger, and Munchinger was in Stuttgart and Richter was in Munich and you know, there, and you have the Tominer Corps in Leipzig. It, it's this wonderful tradition. It's an ongoing tradition of Bach performance in Germany. And they've adapted themselves to the period instrument movement quite successfully. And the Bach Choir of Mainz is one of those groups that has done that under Rolf Otto. So I really recommend that you hear this. And if you like it, you should also hear their Christmas Oratorio and St. Matthew Passion. They're, they're very, very fine performances. They really are. Now, the St. Matthew. Oh, there's so many versions of it now. So many. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It's like, it's like a daily occurrence. This is a piece that you should hear twice in a lifetime. If then, it's such a massive work. But, you know, the, the performance that really turned me on to the period instrument movement for the St. Matthew Passion was the original Herrewege on Harmonia Mundi. It's, it's, it's a wonderful performance because unlike Klemperer's, which is this slow, monolithic, you know, grim, austere performance, the Herwege was, was lilting and lyrical and extremely beautiful. But it, it, had, it had, I think, 
its 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 own legitimacy in a completely different way. Then, of course, Haravega made another one, um, you know, with for Harmonia Mundi with wonderful singers too. And I I can't choose between them. And I don't know if he's done it a third time. I think Hera Vega has, it's too much of a good thing. His versions cancel as far as I'm concerned. And so I did not pick them, but either one of them, they're, they're, they're fabulous. They're absolutely fabulous. The one that I chose um, to represent, I think the period instrument movement at its best um, with stunning fidelity and sound and smart, smart choices as to performing forces, because you know, the, the, the St. Matthew Passion is the one that really suffers the most from the small is better period instrument idea. Excuse me, there we go. You know, because it's written for double choir, two orchestras. I mean, you know, there's a limit to how much you can strip it down and how much it suffers when you do. You know, it's got to sound big. It needs the contrast. It's very long. It needs to have as much color and contrast as possible within you know, whatever performance you choose. So you've got to have, it doesn't have to be huge in terms of forces, but you've got to have enough. You've got to have enough people to really make sensible, reasonable, artistically meaningful, exciting contrast. And I think the performance that does that just fabulously is this one on Channel Classics with the, the Netherlands Bach Society. Um, the Netherlands Bach Society under under Jos van Veldhoven, how to pronounce it, and a lot of singers whose names I'm not going to pronounce. They're all very, very good. The choirs are superb. This is done in connection with the Museum Katarin Convent, something, Katar, Katar, Katarin Convent, something like that. And these performances are, are fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. This is a great one. It comes with this sanitized for your protection toilet band around the disc here, just like you get in a little hotel, you know, when you go to the bathroom, they have one of these things around the toilet seat. So you know it's all clean and tidy and sanitized. But beyond that, you get an amazing booklet with photographs and artwork. I mean, it's, it's just a first class production. And Channel Classics always, always offers the, the best possible sonics. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's eight minutes for the opening course as opposed to 12 for Klemperer. It's period instrument, lighter, fleeter tempos, but not it's not excessive in any way. It's deeply considered and meaningful in my view. It's a, it's a beautiful performance, a glowing performance. And I, again, I, I usually don't listen to the whole thing at a sitting. I dip in here and there. I listen to arias that I feel like, I listen to the choruses when I feel like it. Um, you know, the evangelist and Jesus, well, eh, you know, who cares? <laughs> but you may, I don't. But it's, it, it's a, a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous performance. And finally, we come to the B minor mass. Now, I love the B minor mass. The B minor mass, of course, was intended by Bach as the apotheosis of of choral and vocal writing in, in 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 out of everything that he did and he assembled it and wrote some new stuff but basically assembled it from pre-existing music and that has been taken as an excuse to claim it's not a complete work which is just the dumbest thing i've ever heard in my life it's absolutely untrue i mean why would he put it together if it wasn't going to be put together as a together thing right it's just you know scholarship run amok you know as 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 it concerns the B minor mass. And also the B minor mass has this issue because we know that, you know, Bach's performance forces of some of the original bits must have been quite tiny. It's better to do it quite tiny, which is stupid. Just plain stupid. You've got to work for five part chorus that grows to six parts of the Sanctus and eight parts in, in the Ozana. And you've got a large orchestra with solo horns and bassoons and trumpets and, you know, it, it needs. It's, it's a grand work on a grand scale, period. There is no other legitimate interpretation of the piece. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have, as I've said, a huge range of performing forces, but you, again, you have to have the contrast and the color and the scale, the size, the perception of bigness in these pieces. You really do, you just have to. And, and I really think that 
the other issue that you need to keep in mind is that Bach never heard the whole thing in his lifetime. He put it together as his testament. It's an ideal work. So the performance should have an element of that idealism. It's not about the grubby, disgusting, horrible conditions that Bach had to put up with, with squeaky boy soloists and people who never used deodorant and, and, and never bathed. And I mean, what are you supposed to do? You know, reproduce the stench that must have taken place when everybody was around each other in those days? It was disgusting. And I don't want to hear a performance based on artistic conditions that were equally putrid and disgusting. That's, that's false historicism. Absolutely historic. You know, you know, you know, Tovey said it best. Tovey said, scholarship is not obligated to insist on the restoration of conditions that never should have existed in the first instance. And boy, does that dictum apply to the St. Matthew Passion. So the performances, I mean, the, Saint Matthew, the B minor mass. So performances of the B minor mass on period instruments that I prefer are those that have a somewhat idealized sense of the work, that realize it as the, the amazing, comprehensive, complex, all-encompassing, <laughs> universal work that Bach really intended it to be. I mean, there's no question about what his intention was then. And my performance, and I've talked about this one before, is Hengelbrock. Thomas, Heng Thomas Hengelbrock with the, the Balthasar Neumann Choir and the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra. This is in the Balthasar Neumann box, and I talked about it when I reviewed that box. This was actually a, the sound, the, the, the soundtrack to like a ballet or something, which I just find unspeakably German and incredibly bizarre. But even so, the performance is thrilling. It is unbelievably well sung. It dances, it's warm, it's humane, it's it's just a knockout. It's absolutely a knockout. And there are many, many fine performances on the, of the B minor mass on period instruments. There was the new the there was Bruggen's on, on Glossa. There was the one with what's that group? Archangelo or something like that or whatever they're called on Hyperion, which is absolutely terrific. New ones are coming out all the time. It's a very popular work to do. And it's almost hard to find it done poorly nowadays. It really is. Uh, there are a, a lot of them, and they're very, very exciting. But this one, I think, has a special distinction in its, its, its color, its passion, its warmth, its precision, its excitement, its clarity. It's just, it's just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So that is the, the summary of great Bach choral music on period instruments. And just to run by it one more time, for the Magnificat, Christopher's on Coro, for the Christmas Oratorio, Jacob on Harmonia Mundi, for the St. John Passion, Otto on Naxos, for the uh, St. Matthew Passion, the Netherlands Bach Society with von Veldhoven on Channel Classics, and finally for the B minor Mass, Hengelbrock on Deutsche Harmonia Mundi. And it's still available. It's available. Get it while you can, folks. There you go. All the Bach you need, except for the cantatas, which we are doing one at a time as part of the Bach cantata schlep, which I hope you're going to tune into. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you and take care. <laughs>